Hey you guys and girls, welcome back to Steel Faith Overhaul. I am Indy Pride from Milk and Cookies Total War, and today we'll be taking a look at one of the most popular mods in the Total War Warhammer series. Now there are a ton of differences between SFO and the base game. There's no way I could cover it all in one video, but we can go through and highlight some of the new features and design decisions that really make it stand out from the crowd. Big round of applause for Timekeeper, who made that fantastic trailer at the beginning. Link to his channel will be in the pinned comment and description below. Make sure you go check him out. Now, full disclosure, the SFO mod team is donating money to my beer and bong fund for supporting the mod as long as I have. As you guys know, I've been covering it off and on for more than a year, done a bunch of videos for it. I never expected to get paid by them, but they broached the topic with me recently and wanted to show their appreciation for sending people their way. And I'm not going to say no to a little extra cash, especially with YouTube bending a lot of content creators over with their completely bizarre and opaque demonetization system. So yeah, just letting you know, if I ever get paid to do a video or a mod team donates to support me, I will make that known, but it's not going to affect my opinions on the mod. I cover it because I like it, I enjoy it, I've played it a bunch as you guys know, and I probably wouldn't be reviewing a mod if I didn't, because this isn't really a review channel. This, honestly, this video isn't really going to be a review either, more like a showcase with a fun little battle at the end. I will say, because Total War Warhammer 2 is in better shape than Game 1, in terms of making Legendary Lords feel legendary, in terms of magic being more impactful and fun to use on the battlefield, in terms of unit balance and variety, I feel that SFO won't be quite as essential for some people as it was in Game 1. CA took community feedback and made a better second iteration of the game in my opinion, despite the glaring issues still affecting Mortal Empires, but even with all that said, Steel Faith Overhaul is a blast to use, it contrasts nicely with the base game, and accentuates a lot of the stuff that makes Warhammer 2 so good, and pushes it even further, adding additional lore and Warhammer flavor. I encourage anybody who has never played a vanilla Warhammer campaign to do that first, and then give SFO a try. Combat, campaign mechanics, magic, and unit variety all feel different between the two, and I think it can be a fantastic way to extend the life cycle of a game, or frankly just try out something fresh and interesting if you're starting to get bored with the base game. So for someone who's never heard of this mod before, what the hell is Steel Faith Overhaul? Well, it should be obvious from the name, it's an overhaul mod created by Steel Faith, Venerous and a team of additional modders with the purpose of overhauling Total War Warhammer 2 to be closer to the lore and established canon of the Warhammer universe. Elite units like Blood Knights and Grail Knights are more dangerous, more expensive and have fewer entities in a unit, demonstrating their power and superhuman nature. Health pools across the board are increased, which helps battles last a bit longer. The winds and magic pools increase to allow casters to make a bigger impact on the battlefield, and many spells are rebalanced to make them more noticeable and impactful like Foot of Gork, which does more damage across the board, but costs more winds and magic to cast, Barona's Time Warp from the Lore of Light, which grants 65% increase to unit speed rather than 24%, and so on. There are a ton of faction reworks that completely change how your campaigns play out, and Chaos Invasion scripts that make the end game more challenging and interesting. For example, Archaeon and the Legendary Lords for Chaos will actually retreat and recruit troops to replenish losses, so you won't see a sad, lonely Kolek with a sliver of HP left wandering around the wastelands waiting for someone to finally put him out of his misery. City garrisons are significantly bigger and scarier, so taking a capital city like Karzak Rak or Altdorf can be a lot more challenging, as it should be. They're some of the most well-defended areas on the planet, and perhaps the biggest change overall is with the units and battlefield presence of each faction themselves. When you think of the Wood Elves, what do you think of? Incredibly fast, agile, great archers, low armor, high stamina, right? Those are the kind of ideas that come into your head. Well, that's what you get in Steel Faith, and everything is essentially turned up to 11. Way Watchers become the premier powerful snipers and ambushers they were meant to be. Hawk Riders give you that insane mobility in the air. War Dancers are squishy, but will carve through unarmored infantry like a hot knife through butter, and the number of entities per unit are quite low, showing that on average, an elf is a more elite combatant than an orc, a goblin, or a skaven, but heavily outnumbered because the races are basically dying. Whereas the elven factions have significantly lower numbers compared to vanilla, the swarm factions like the vampire counts, skaven, and greenskins have much bigger armies, with slaves or zombies getting up to 200 to 300 entities per unit. And monster units are smaller and more powerful as well. Vargeis, armored trolls, and dragon ogres have 4 in a unit compared to their 12 or 16 in the base game, and this means that on a per model basis, they are a lot tougher to bring down. 
Some of the already existing units have different roles than they have in vanilla as well. Azrai Spear War Dancers are meant purely to combat high armor targets with their armor sundering, while Wildwood Rangers hunt those big fear-causing monsters with their bonus versus large. And High Elf White Lions are another great example. They're higher tier now, 1100 gold instead of 900, armor sundering with 40% missile resistance, befitting their role as the bodyguards of the Phoenix King. I covered most of them in previous videos, but there are a decent amount of new units as well. Beastmen with marks of each Chaos God for completely different playstyles, support units like Chaos Zealots and Shadow Dancers, Black Grail Knights, and a few single entity additions like Zombie and Chaos Dragons. The marked Beastmen units are probably my favorite addition of the lot. They allow you to play a very themed Beastmen campaign, and they each fill pretty different roles as well. Corn Gores have a bonus versus infantry and high armor. Pestigores have health regeneration and poison attacks, but are very slow. Salon Gores are incredibly fast, almost double the speed of Nurgle Beastmen, and have armor-piercing great weapons, but they're much squishier. They'll die like crazy in melee. And Zinch Gores have a ability of radius, essentially, that lowers magic resistance of enemies while dealing magical damage in melee as well. So they can be a serious threat to the Wood Elves and other units that rely on their physical resistance. A few of these additions, I think, miss the mark in my opinion, but most are handled with care, and there are maybe only a handful of examples of roster bloat overall. Bretonian Foot Knights are a big one there, will always be debate over, but they're very hard to recruit, they're expensive, and outclassed by pretty much every other elite infantry unit in the game, so it's hard to say that their inclusion wasn't well thought out. The vast majority of these new unit additions have a very logical place in their respective roster, and don't overshadow base game units or break outside the lore really at all. And at the end of the day, if you don't like them, you can always mod them out. There are a bunch of different sub-mods that allow you to tailor your play to your exact specifications, so if you don't like playing with units that aren't in the base game, but you still want to reap the benefits of the rest of SFO, just activate the no new units in SFO sub-mod, and you're good to go. It's super easy that way. Chaos in particular has received a lot of love. When you conquer a settlement now, you have a choice of sacking and raising it in the name of a particular Chaos God. So for one, this solves the incredibly annoying issue of having to sack, replenish, and then raise again on the next turn, but it also gives you a meaningful choice, granting you additional weapon strength for 5 turns if you raise for Corn, movement range if you raise for Slanesh, horde growth if you raise for Nurgle, and unit replenishment if you raise for Zeech. Chaos Lords also get Marks of Chaos now, which can completely change how your Lord and Army fight. Characters like Archaeon and Kolek have become absolutely terrifying, which leads me into my next point. If you aren't a big fan of Legendary Lords turning into ungodly killing machines, this may not be the mod for you. As I've alluded to on numerous occasions, one of the design goals is to make it feel as much like the Warhammer universe as possible, which means characters like the Ever Chosen, like the Herald of the Tempest, can get to a point where they're pretty much immortal against the AI. This isn't true in multiplayer, obviously, because a real player knows how to deal with Lords, but and frankly, this is true in van vanilla as well. If you get some ward save items and stack them up with the quest battle drops for particular lords, they essentially can become unkillable by the AI. As with vanilla or any other Total War campaign, it's up to you whether you want to abuse that or not. I know that in my base game Tyrion campaign with the Blood of an Arion skill chain, I was able to completely solo armies with him, and you can definitely do that in Steel Faith as well. Some people are going to love the ability for a special character like Colex Sun Eater to wade in and slaughter thousands by himself, others won't. You don't have to abuse it, but I'm telling you right now that the Lords are ridiculously powerful in SFO, but garrisons and enemy army compositions are also a lot better, so it kind of makes up for it. The Grand Campaign sub-factions like Order of Loremasters and Clan Pestilence have been added to custom battle and multiplayer, which is really something Creative Assembly needs to do as well. Using Clan Moore's color scheme with Skrulk and a full Pestilence army is just gross. It feels wrong, especially if you're like hardcore into the Warhammer thing. But even if not, being having the ability to choose between color schemes makes sense, especially when in game one we have that option with Warheart of the Shadow Gave, Bordelow, Carcassonne, uh, Middenland, and all these other minor sub factions that are in multiplayer. So not having access to that for the game two factions feels really weird. That really needs to change. So hopefully by the time Norska patch or first faction DLC rolls around, those will be in as well. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, SFO is compatible for both campaign and multiplayer battles. So you can do head-to-head, -head, you can do multiplayer, you can do any kind of content you want in SFO in terms of campaign or multiplayer side of things. One of the coolest things about a mod like this though, is that it is constantly getting updates and support and additional love. If there's a game-breaking bug, it gets fixed in days, not weeks or months. There's no red tape a modder has to cut through, except, I guess, 
community backlash, which I guess there is still some of that that modders have to deal with. But unlike CA, who have to jump through hoops to get things approved and sometimes move at what seems like a glacial pace in terms of the patching process, if there's a balance issue, if there's a unit that's unequivocally overperforming for its cost, that stuff can get changed with a snap of a finger by a modder. They can go in, change a data table, and have that patch live the same day. Doesn't mean it always will be done that fast, but it's nice to not have to wait weeks or months for a fix if there's a big problem, which is something we do have to worry about in the base game. Now, a big change coming with this version of Steel Faith is the addition of faction-wide skills for every race in the game. Passive abilities like Martial and Murderous Prowess for the High Elves and Dark Elves, but for every other faction, all the Game 1 factions as well. A few of them do need a rework, maybe feeling a bit shoehorned in right now, like they were put in just so that every faction could have one, not because the faction is actually designed from the ground up to work around these passives, but at the same time, they do add some additional flavor and flair, and some of them are really cool. So let's go over those now. For the Wood Elves, Speed of the Forest grants plus 15% speed and plus 10% vigor when above the 50% HP threshold, while Protectors of the Forest for Tree Spirits grants additional physical resistance. For Bretonia, the Peasant's Duty gives plus 4 melee attack and plus 2 melee defense, while the Knight's Duty increases leadership and charge bonus substantially. I should also note that in Campaign, the Green Knight gets his own skill tree and customization options, so he's much more of a force of nature there. The Dwarfs get Unyielding and Undying O's. Their stubbornness basically contributes to their melee defense, physical resistance, and missile resistance. Greenskins get their WA with the ability to stack two separate melee attack and charge bonus buffs. The Empire's Imperial Tactics augments armor-piercing damage and reload skill, allowing Empire Captains and Generals to buff handgunner lines quite substantially, so if you want to get a big handgunner line going, definitely want to anchor it with one of these bad boys. And the Binding Winds of Blood trait gives Vampire Lords and Heroes higher melee attack and leadership that they can then pass on to units inside a 15 meter radius. The Beastmen get Primal Rage for most elite units, giving them higher weapon damage, charge bonus, speed, and immune to Psyche, again when over that 50% HP threshold, and Chaos gets Chaotic Crusade for most infantry units and heroes and lords, plus 10% weapon damage and AP damage, and Vigor, so plus 10% to all three of those things, and then Chaotic Blessing for elite units like Chosen doubles these effects to 20%. So yeah, while a few of these like the Peasant's Duty could probably be rethought or trashed altogether, doesn't seem that important or that impactful, and I'm not sure it even makes that much sense with the lore, Overall, these changes are definitely good. They add some additional flavor to the mod, and they're pretty fun to play around with. Now, I will say, I have not played enough battles yet to see the entire effect they have on the campaign or multiplayer metagame. Some of them are very strong. The Warriors of Chaos 1 in particular, alongside all the other buffs Chaos gets in SFO, that passive might be too good. But the new faction passives do have a theme that generally match up well with their particular factions, and I think overall they're a pretty nice addition. But I do imagine there will be more changes to come in the coming days and weeks. This seems more like a baseline. This is an, as, was an idea that they had. They implemented it, and now once they get some feedback, they'll be able to incorporate more stuff in and make sure that it's more balanced. And So if you have any ideas, if you think one is too strong, if you think one of those passives is too weak, let the mod team know. They can try to incorporate your ideas into the mod itself. Now, speaking of coming changes, Game 2 factions and legendary lord casters like Teclas, like Mazda Mundi, Marathi, and the Fey Enchantress, they'll be getting more spells and even some new ones to help differentiate them even a bit more. In particular, I'm really looking forward to Marathi's changes because as we know, she's one of the few legendary lords in Total War Warhammer 2 who feels more like a Game 1 lord, a bit anemic, a bit disappointing compared to her status in the lore as one of the oldest and most powerful spellcasters in all of existence. And I imagine by the end, she'll have the majority of the Lords of Shadows, Death, and Darkness. Right now, of course, she has a mix of those three lores, but only two in each. I imagine SFO will make that spell selection quite a bit larger. Ultimately, the best things about this mod are the super active and large community, and the constant updates and easy access to other people who are actually playing. On the Discord server, you can pretty much always get your questions answered or find games, and it's a good way to make new friends and find people to play with, so I highly encourage you guys to try it out if you've never played it before. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, I'll say that now, and some of the changes are less noticeable than they were in Game 1, because I think CA's done a better job of pushing that envelope and making Lords feel exciting and powerful in Game 2. But you will still notice a significant difference between the two, and honestly, I think the best way to know if it's for you or not is to try out a normal campaign, vanilla, for 30 turns or so, then try out SFO with that exact same faction 
for another 30 turns and just see how you like it. Try out those changes for yourself. Mods do tend to be very polarizing. There are always going to be fanboys who vehemently defend any good or bad changes for it, just as there will always be haters who trash on it every chance they get. Only way to know if it's for you is to get some gaming done on it from the comfort of your own home. So that concludes the overview portion of this video. Let's jump into a Steel Faith overhaul battle between Lord Skrulk and Clan Pestilence against Warzag, the Great Green Prophet, and the Orcs of the Bloody Hand. Let's have some fun. So here in the heart of darkness, the carnivorous jungle of Lustria, Mr. Plague Rat himself, and the doity rat boys of Clan Pestilence have set up shop. And Warzag, the Great Green Prophet, and the dancing savage Orcs of the Bloody Hand tribe are having none of it. So you can see I went for a full Clan Pestilence army, also have the color scheme. Thankfully, those were added in custom battle. And on top of Spleen Ripper, Wurzag, looking to do some dancing, looking to do some casting and smacking the Skaven into the moist jungle loam. Big, scary, giant looking savage and dumb as a box of rocks. And the Crimson Killers are joining in on the fun as well. They are terrifying in Steel Faith Overhaul. Very few units in the game that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. But Plague Sensor Bears and their armor piercing can at least rack up some damage on them over time. We shall see if it's enough to stop their rampage. Hopefully, the Plague Claw Catapults, which are reaping their terrible, filthy toll before the Lions Clash, can equalize those numbers a bit more. Clan Rats being summoned in the front lines to blunt the charge of these Savage Orcs who are coming in now. A ton of physical resistance on them. Very low armor, of course. And Dewa is popped, and melee begins in earnest here. Now, the Clan Rats were summoned on the right flank of Clan Pestilence to block some charges, and big foot of Gork on top of some Plague Sensor Bears taking them down to half HP and leaving a bloody ruin in its wake. Doom Wheels on the field might look to charge up the center and view some terror in the center of the Greenskin Rush, the Savage Orc Giant. Bashing heads in, crumping skulls, doing what the Greenskins do best even though it's not even a Greenskin. Doom Wheel doesn't really care if it runs over its own allies, won't actually do friendly fire damage there, but with those Warp Lightning Cannon shots coming out the side of it, it might. And I brought a help it for one reason and one reason only. Deal with big, scary solo entities like a savage greenskin giant. Abominations are the stuff of nightmares, man. Look at that charge coming in. 650 weapon strength, a ton of that armor piercing, and bonus versus large. That should be a very interesting fight. We'll see how it progresses. Play Claw Catapults get a little bit of friendly fire. Very Skaven friendly fire into the back ranks of the Plague Sensor Bears and Plague Monks. Left flank is holding well for now. Now, interestingly enough, and I believe this was actually the first time I've seen it. I don't know if this is a holdover from a creative assembly bug or what the deal is, but the black orcs are appearing white in my game. I don't know if that's only in Steel Faith Overhaul or if that was fixed in Mortal Empires and the bug just hasn't fi gotten fixed in SFO yet. It's something they should probably sort out. Um, it doesn't look very good. The white black orcs kind of defeats the purpose, right? But they're still just as scary as they are in the base game. In fact, more so. Another foot of Gork coming down, demolishing some more Plague Sensor Bears. Look at that damage, man. That hurt a lot, but that's also a ton of the Winds of Magic pool. I want to say that foot of Gork is like 28 Winds of Magic in this. And you start out with a base of 50 in a Winds of Magic pool. That's the max you can get up to. But yeah, that is a lot of Winds of Magic to cast two foot foots of Gork in quick succession there. So the Doom Wheel. Kind of overseeing the engagement between the Hellpit Abomination and the Savage Greenskin Giant, then charging into the back of his own troops, rolling through everything, siding them, cutting them up into itty-bitty pieces, firing some warp lightning in there for good measure, jibbing a couple of Greenskins. That should help bolster the left flank of Clan Pestilence at the moment. Meanwhile, Wolf Rider is peppering down that Plague Furnace that is currently bolstering the right flank of Clan Pestilence. Savage Orc Greenskin Boar Boy Big Guns charging in. Looking to do some damage, and they'd be a great target to take down that Plague Furnace. Which is going to be very tough for these Black Orcs to deal with by themselves. They do have AP, but tying it down, it's basically a chariot. It, can, it has a ton of mass, can push through pretty much any of those entities, and just continuously lower their health pool with that aura of death and disease. Black Orcs are not doing very well right now. The Sensor Bears are siding them apart with their armor-piercing damage and lowering their leadership and surrounded like that. Black Orcs probably won't be able to hold on for very long. Plague Monks in the center and the Hellpit A-Bomb doing their work. Lord Scroll coming in to reinforce. Doesn't have the Liberal Bubonicus in this game. Very expensive to bring, but it can be great for killing single entities. Summoning some more Clan Rats. 
And this is where bringing Lord Skrulk and a Plague Priest really shines. Having two sources of clan rat summons with Vermintide on both characters just means so many extra bodies for rear charging, for meat shielding, for tying down enemy units. Just really powerful. It demonstrates the swarm tactics Skaven are known for. Being able to summon them all over the battlefield is a lot of fun too. So the Doom Wheel. Sowing terror in Discord now in and amongst the poor Gobbo artillery crew. Smacking into the catapult now and jibbing one unfortunate Gobbo. And then it's a hammer of Gork. So you would think that'd actually be crewed by a bunch of orcs, not goblins. But I guess that's how it is in the base game as well. And the Hell Pit, Abomination, and Giant are still going at it. Very interesting thing about SFO. The HP pools are so big. They're about 30% bigger or so. Actually, the HP pools might be even bigger than that. But the battles typically last about 30% longer. So they're still fighting, even though he just got knocked down. I think he routed. And now the Savage Orcs and the Black Orcs. Dealing with some Clan Rat summons. Broken Tusk Mob and all these Savage Orc Cavalry are going to be a serious issue for the Skaven, though, as we approach the middle to later stages of the game. The Skaven don't have any Stormfront with Halberds on the field. Again, full Clan Pestilence build. So they have a serious issue dealing with that kind of cavalry. And when big, angry boars run straight into your face gonna have a bad time plague monks with their low armor can't really deal with those kind of charges but in this case savage orcs were so low it will actually route once the fear causing lord scroll manages to get into melee but yeah with some good with some good rear charging with some good cavalry micro here greenskins could be in very good shape because even the sensor bears not going to enjoy charges from boars to the rear or from the front either. They do have the armor piercing, which means they do have the high melee attack as well. They will do damage when those calves charge in, but repeated hammer and anvils will hurt a lot. Now I need, I need someone to tell me once and for all, what the hell that sound is. That popping sound that's going off like crazy. What triggers that sound? It happens every Skaven battle I've ever played. It's not clan rat summons dying, because it happens even when I don't bring Vermintide or the Plague Monk summon. Someone please help me. I don't know what it is. It's a, it's a terrible sound. And apparently a lot of people don't even get it. They don't even hear that sound when they're playing. And I, I, I want to finally figure out that I'm not going crazy. And have someone tell me that they've heard it too. But yeah. Anyway. Help it Abomination. Waiting in against a bunch of the Broken Tusk Mob. Breathing. <laughs> like literally breathing Warp Lightning into their faces. And a couple of boars go running for the hills. Because they don't want to deal with that thing. Probably the most terrifying model in all of Total War Warhammer. And the Doom Wheel is doing so much work. Now, Jack really needed to get some of those cavalry in and amongst the Doom Wheel, basically surround it and just prevent it from running away. Because even with its big mass, cavalry like the Broken Tusk Mob will prevent it from moving. And then you can just kind of cut it apart with the armor piercing damage. But he hasn't been able to do it so far. Now, there is some cav coming in now, but they're so low and they're just savage orcs. They don't have great leadership. Terror might just cause them to rout. So he has to be very careful about his cavalry here. He wants to save it for the late game because a rear charge at the right opportunity with the giant coming back from routing might be enough to cause a chain route in the Skaven line because they don't have great leadership either. And right now, frankly, it's a battle of bad leadership on both sides. Even the Hellpit Abomination, really not going to enjoy getting charged by Broken Tusk Mob. But the Plague Furnace is surrounded and this is what you needed to do right away is get these big single entities surrounded with his cavalry and kill them off. And it goes down, Plague Priest falls into the jungle loam, and he's dead and off the field. That's a big blow to his clan pestilence in the Skaven line. Giant breathing some Superman frozen breath on the back of some of those Plague Monks who run away, and I don't blame them. And the Hamster Wheel of Death looking for some new juicy targets. Giant won't be one of those. Wants to make sure it stays very far away from that thing. The Giant does not have a lot of HP, only about 2,000 last time we checked. I guess the Hellpit Abomination does 650 weapon damage. A lot of that AP and additional bonus versus large would be a serious issue if the Giant decides to take it on again. But smacking on Lord Skrulk, and Lord Skrulk can't take that either. Here we go. Hellpit Abomination and a bloody Giant, completely drenched in its victim's lifeblood. Here we go, big attack coming in, and that's it! The Giant goes down with a crazy attack from the help at A-Bomb. And now the Giant is off the field. But Warzag, the Great Green Prophet, still alive, casting Effigy of the Git. Trying to close in on that Doom Wheel, and Warzag hits like a truck in this mod, too. He's a caster first and foremost, but his melee prowess is not bad. In fact, it's great. 
compared to a lot of the other lords in the game. So, he can definitely put some hurt on the Doom Wheel. And with the Wolf Riders coming in and surrounding it, this is not the engagement the Doom Wheel wants at all. Warzag and some Wolf Riders can put the hurt on that. So, the, the Doom Wheel runs away, tries to get some space. But running away from 105 move speed Wolf Riders is very tough. With the help of the Abomination, Lord Skrulk working together to take down the Goblin Big Boss. But Lord Skrulk is routed. He barely has any HP left. And if he routes or dies, that could cause a chain route that completely cascades and cause the entire Skaven army to run for the hills. Pretty much only the Hellbit Abomination would probably stick around. Maybe the Doom Wheel. But the rest of the infantry for both sides is almost completely gone. Goblins running away. Help it given chase, but soon realizes it won't be able to catch up to them. And that horrifying monstrosity looks for its next target. Meanwhile, the Doom Wheel still running away desperately, trying so hard to get away from the Wolf Riders. It's really not designed to deal with large targets, and Wolf Riders do count as large. So, looking for something for it to kill, Lord Scroll comes back with only a sliver of HP left. One or two hits from Warzag would be enough to finish him off. And we have a very interesting game on our hands here. It's going to be a very close one. I can say that much. What's left on the field? Some clan rat summons are coming in, but they'll die off by themselves. Warzag doesn't even need to fight them. He can just deal with the Doom Wheel or run away and let them kind of expire on their own. Uh, Lord Skrulk's alive with a sliver of HP left. The Doom Wheel's alive, but Hell Pit Abomination is alive. And that Hell Pit is probably the biggest issue the Greenskins have right now. But they have Warzag. They do have a little bit of Cav left. They have their Hammer of Gork. And look at the Balance Bar. Balance Bar is in the Greenskin's favor because, as we see a boar drenched in a bunch of bl Skaven blood, I guess, running away, the Greenskins still have their artillery, which can fire in and do some damage to the Clan Rats as they move in. And they have Warzag with a bunch of his Winds of Magic left. Not a ton, but remember that Winds of Magic pools are way bigger in SFO, so even with those two foots of Gork, he should still be able to do some casting. Big shot coming in from the Hammer of Gork there. And the Clan Rats took a lot of damage and some more shots. Getting ready to come in. Jib and a couple more. Clan Rats will make it into melee, but point blank shots. Pancaking a few of the Ratties. And finally, they will tie down the artillery, but they might just rout. The artillery crew might be able to just rout those Clan Rats off. Lord Skrulk is still alive. Warzak <laughs> running away from the Hell Pit. Doesn't want to fight him, but can... Pretty much silence Lord Scroll here if he gets a good charge in. Coming in now. Warzag with a big charge with Spleen Ripper. And Lord Scroll is down and dusted. No, he's not. He's alive. Lord Scroll is actually still alive. And a, a really unlucky artillery shot came in. Did some damage to the boar as well. But even though Scroll got back up, I think he's just running away. Yeah, he's he's done. I think Scroll is off the field. He's not dead. But I don't know that he's gonna come back from that. He's routed two or three times already this battle, and he might have just shattered. Now, Warzag is still thinking about these engagements. The Hell Pit has almost no HP left. Warzag might be able to bypass that physical resistance because he does deal magical attacks. That's a big deal, something you got to think about as we move here towards the last duel. But the Doom Wheel is also an issue. Not good against Warzag, though, finishing off some of the Black Arts who are running away, running them over. Always fun to see that thing in action. And now, Warzag and the Hell Pit Abomination for the final duel. If Warzag finishes off the A-bomb here, no, 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 routes. Gets Terror routed, and that is the end of the game. If he had been able to finish off that Hell Pit that only had about 1,500 HP left or so, then he would have been able to kill a Doom Wheel. There's no way a Doom Wheel deals with Warzag in the final stages there. But Terror was enough to seal it. And that was a very close game. Slivers of HP left on two single entities, and that was it. So, great game to Jack. He played very well that game, honestly. Look at his cavalry. Look at the kills on that cav. Broken Tusk Mob, 121. Almost 300 on one of the Savage Orc cavalry, 128. Crimson Killers actually didn't do a whole lot, but I did focus them down quite a bit with my artillery. And you can see the, the kills on both sides are pretty inflated, honestly. Plague Monks, 241. Sensor Bears, 129, 116. Hell Pit Abomination, 71 kills. One of the biggest buffs it got was higher melee attack and SFO. So it is a much better monster unit than it is in vanilla. Lord Scroll didn't do a whole lot for me. But that is SFO. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace out.